James Hammond here. I think James is laughing at us. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure James is laughing at us. Hey, James. Hey, guys. Um, we're talking about Derek Carr crying last night. Or yep. yes. Um, I believe it was genuine. I just I I don't know if I'm Devontae Adams, if that's what I want in the moment. Like, I I, I don't know. He he I get you. I but but again, I, I don't think it was fake. His words though, namely the words at the end, that was to me, that was kind of heavy. That was kind of powerful. Were we talking I, about what we go through to sleep and to play and all yeah, of that? Well, him saying that, and I was like, okay, I'm feeling you. But when he ended it with, yeah, I feel bad because there's some guys in here who don't feel the same way that I do right now. Mm. I was like, mm. okay. Mm. That's what made me well, they look the like that. press conference. Yeah, they look like that. They they look like it. They played football like all of them don't care. Mm. Mm. What do you think, yeah. James? I've always said it, it's very specific when you can tell that the, the coaches lost the locker room, it's time to go. And what Derek Carr is basically saying is that while he hasn't lost Derek Carr, he's lost a bunch of people in that room. And yeah, but, that means yeah. it, it's time to go. It doesn't matter who you are as the owner or anything else. If you don't understand that, that basic concept, then like, I, I mean, and we could say this forever, like the Davis fam family are a tra- Travis Sham, a mockery of, of MB, uh, NFL like franchise owners. They're just a joke. Um, and they have been for a long time. And like, I think there is nothing more like, like it's sarcastic, almost the commitment to excellence. Like they're committed to just drilling their, their fan base to putting out the worst product ever. And just to not, like understand any of it that's that's what it's come down to i mean al davis was a like incredible mind forever but uh like just the way that he ran that franchise into the ground in the later years and then it has just handed it over to this guy who you know he's just so out of touch he's so out of touch i mean walking around in like acid wash jeans it's like hey man this is not 1987 like what is happening here and that's what it feels like with these guys it's just one thing after another, and I feel for Carr, but like, be a leader of men. Then, like, if your coach can't capture the imagination, then then you try to do it and, and see what happens. I, I don't know. It that it's a train wreck, and there's no excuse why that team is so bad. But you know, Carr is kind of he's done this for a while now. He hasn't been that great. But you, but you know what, James, and I hear everything you're saying, and we'll bring this all the way back around here to Sacramento. It's kind of 2021 2022 sacramento kings ish right when we kept asking for this for De'Aaron fox you know like yo be a leader be a leader and it was clear at least it looks clear now back in in hindsight there were guys in there that didn't want to be led right and i don't know what you do at that point like i know as a matter of fact i know what you do at that point you say my ankles hurt until you get these people that don't want to be led out of here and that's what their car might need to do. Yeah. Right. Like, cause yeah. I'm trying to be a leader. He needs some I, ankle soreness. He needs some ankle soreness. I'm trying <laughs> to be a leader and I'm trying to get everybody on the right page, but there's a handful of guys over here that just refuse to even give a damn about what I'm talking about. I can't do my job. I can't be a leader the way you're asking me to be in the way D'Lo and KC are saying that I should be with guys that don't want to be led. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm, I'm, just to what Derek Carr was talking about last night. Mm-hmm. I understand that, and I think one of the bigger issues an NFL team, I mean, we're talking about like 53 guys, but then there's like a taxi squad and a bunch of other dudes that are like waiting to go on the taxi squad. I mean, it's a huge group of people, and you can have factions in a locker room splinter everything really quickly. And uh, and if you don't have 100% buy-in, even if it's you don't have 100% buy-in an offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator or linebackers coach like if you lose a group of players you're in all kinds of trouble and i I mean again i don't even know if you guys even they lost to a head coach who's never coached anything ever i mean just never he was sitting across from mike greenberg six days ago (laughs) yeah i mean that's who you lost to and, and like what kind of embarrassment is that and and like you've just lost the room and if you don't figure out a way to 
to like bring it back in really quickly. I mean, this is a point where, again, we're hearing today that haven't they like already told their head coach that oh. he's going to be around all next season? Like yeah, next that's season, man. that's just it, that it's not yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're listening to D'Lo and KC on KIFM. West Sacramento, 98.5 FM, KRX, QHD2, Sacramento, ESPN, 1320, driven by Lashers, Elk Grove, Dodge, always live on the free Odyssey app, live on Twitch, live on YouTube as well as we welcome in 1320 Kings Insider, creator of the Kings Beat, our colleague, James Ham. James! The Kings are 500. Let's go. Let's go. Come on, James. This 500. Is the, this, is uh, the, this is the best 500 feeling ever. You know, it really is a, a big mo uh, monumental move for them to get back to 500. I, I know we were talking on the podcast last week, and uh, it was before they strung some some stuff together. Sean brought up the point like, hey, they may, may never get back to 500 this season. And like that, that was a possibility. Like this team, like at three or four games under, you never know. You know, it's kind of like the whole lead change thing. How many times you have lead changes in a game? Well, you know, like the Kings last night in the first quarter, I, I remember looking and uh, the Warriors had led by 15 at one point and the Kings had never led. And you think in that game, you're like, hmm, they may, they may never lead in this game at all. They may go wire to wire. Um, and that's kind of the way you feel sometimes when the Kings fall under 500, that they may not make it back. They probably won't make it back to 500. All of a sudden, you escape just a brutal first 12 games of the season with three games against the champs. I don't care what they're playing like right now, but three games against the, the reigning NBA champions and, uh, and a bunch of other games against really high quality, uh, you know, like really good teams twice against mm -hmm. Miami heat. Uh, you know, you got the Clippers in there, you got Portland in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Memphis, like there's some really good clubs. I think that they're playing really, really well and really good basketball. And I, I like the brand and, and it's only going to get better. Yeah, man. That, that's part of the story, right? It's not the fact, just the fact that they're 500. It's how they it's got the way here. they're playing. Yeah. It, well, the way they're playing, but how they got here. You know, to yeah. be six and six a, a, after 12 games, after starting 0 and 4, I'm not a math major, but that means you won a lot of games in a short amount of time to get back up to 500. And I remember when they were 0 and 4, we had talked about, um, I think it was the Heat game was next. It's like, hey, if you can find a way to get that Heat game, you know, here at home, then you go on the road, you got a couple, maybe you can get to three and five and be, you know, manageable and, and your season kind of getting back on track. Well, they've come all the way back around. They've come all, back, all the way back around to be at this 500 clip. And like you talked about, Damien, if it, it has – um, shades of, of continuing and growing because of the way they're playing. They're playing really good basketball. Yeah, they've won six out of eight, and the two games they lost were both uh, errors by the officials in the final play of the game. Mm. I mean, that to me, that tells you everything you need to know. I mean, if you even if you, you take out the whole, the officials making an error, and you just say they won six out of eight, and the two games they lost came on buzzer beaters, I mean, that's that's pretty spectacular. And it's not like it's a, you know, a, a cupcake schedule. You've had a couple of teams that you should beat, uh, which I don't know, you know, that always, again, that, that triggers Sean on the pod because <laughs> Sean doesn't believe that the Kings should beat anyone. And, and he's right because that's kind of who they've earned and, and who they are as a franchise over the last 16 years. Um, but at the same time, like, you just see these guys, they're getting behind Mike Brown. And they're stepping up in moments to to just, you know, the the rebound and put back by Sabonis last night late in the game where he literally just ripped a ball out of the hands of like three Warriors and, and put it right back up and in. Uh, De'Aaron Fox just finding ways in every single game to take over. Uh, you know, Keegan Murray coming around and Kevin Herter. Kevin Herter, I think he has, at this point, he has seven out of the 12 games. He's hit four or more three-pointers. Like, I, wow! <laughs> you got to give props to, yeah. to Monty McNair. He's done some amazing things here, and so far, so good. They still need more. They still need to keep growing. Uh, but I think we're going to start seeing more and more from this team each and every week. 
And uh, I, I think it's really cool to watch, especially to see they're they're tied for fifth in offensive rating right now. Hey, that's that's good. You know, they're not even relying on the three pointer to get them through every game. They know how to score when they, the shot's not falling. And yeah, I like what I've, I'm seeing so far. And James, that's one of the things that we talked about as well, where the defense isn't necessarily where we'd want it to be. We talked about how this team could possibly be a top 10 offense if everything started clicking. And it seems like it's clicking right now, right? Like it doesn't matter if it's the Warriors who play no defense or the Cavs who are supposedly one of the top defensive teams in the league. Kings going to get to 115-120. Like that's just what they seem to do right now. And if they could ever find a way to like kind of shore up the defense just a little bit, it's, it's a really good team, man, because I, I think they're going to score all year long. I don't think that's an anomaly at all. Yeah, I mean, but look at how they've they've won games recently. So we can keep talking about the offense and how good the offense has been. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, they finished off the game on Friday with an 8-0 run. Well, you don't have an 8-0 run unless there's an O, <laughs> you know? So yeah. it's like you don't win a no-hitter unless you your team scores a run. So it's nice that you want to give the pitcher all the props for the no-hitter, but you – he could have pitched, you know, 17 no hit innings. And if you don't score a run, he doesn't get the win and he doesn't get the no hitter. So, uh, I think that they're, they're finding ways to get stops when they need to, which is big, you know, and, and they're also like, don't forget, we talked about this early in the season. We talked about it coming into the year that if you can have an efficient, a really, really efficient offense, which the Kings are like top three in true shooting top three in effective field goal percentage, their assist percentage, they're you know in top six, uh, pace, they're they're top eight or nine, but like if you can have an efficient offense, it takes so much stress off your defense because you get to pull, they have to pull the ball out of the basket, and you get to go set up your defense. So it's just giving them that little bit, and there will come a point where they get better on defense. It might require them to go get another player to help on that end, mm-hmm. um, but still like. In the first in the first twelve games, you played Steph Curry three times. You know what that guy does to your defensive numbers? There's nothing you can do when he's got forty seven points. We'll leave eighty nine first half points is what he does to your defensive numbers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it like that's crazy. They're they're doing all right. But the I I I, in, in, I think the overall point is like they're those defense in those moments, like maybe defensive ratings aren't good. Maybe they're, they're, they're lower in the league than we like in that guard uh, regard, maybe just be average, but in the, because their offense is keeping them in games, their defense is doing just enough in the moments where it matters the most. You're seeing everyone from Terrence Davis to De'Aaron Fox to, to Malik Monk to, you know, everyone on the floor, Keegan Murray stepping up in some sort of defensive way to ensure that they win that possession and win that game. Yeah, and, you know, we always talk about um, leadership moments, right? I want to point to something that I think probably somebody missed in the game last night. Uh, Chemezi Metu got isolated at the top of the key against Andrew Wiggins. Wiggins uh, blew by Chemezi and went right to the rack and, and dunked the ball. I was watching, and Metu couldn't shake it. He could not shake it. He was so upset with himself going up and down the court. You could see it taking him out of the game very quickly. And he was so upset with himself. And then I watched Fox notice it, take the Warriors off the dribble, flung a ball around three Warriors when he got to the basket to Metu, who got the ball, ran right down the middle and hammered the ball down and hung on the rim. It was a moment where you saw leadership in the ways that I think De'Aaron Fox can lead, where he can sense something in a in one of his teammates, get them to forget what happened, get them back in the game, and have them flow the right way. And uh, yeah, just like I, there are moments in these games that are like when you're watching, like that was a powerful moment for Fox and for Metu, like for Metu to be able to like shake it off. And to move on and to, you know, get his head back in the game. And that's just not something I've seen in the past. There there weren't concerns for your teammates in the past. Not that you didn't help a guy off the floor, 
but you didn't try to get somebody involved. You didn't try to get someone fixed. Uh, it was a lot of, uh, let me get my numbers and whatever happens, happens. And I don't see that this year. You're suggesting the Aaron's a leader. <laughs> Heck yeah. I'm suggesting he's a leader. Wow. I mean, what he's doing in the fourth quarter, the way he just like, Hey, hop on, let's go. I got yeah. this. I mean, yeah. he scored, uh, he, he had nine points with like 30 seconds left in the third quarter last night. He got a bucket right before the end of the third, went into the fourth with 11 points Finished with 22 points. Mm. His fourth quarter play has been ridiculous mm. recently. Yeah. That Lakers game is such a defining moment for De'Aaron Fox for me. He was so like, He on was point. just so was good so in that game. Point. He, was, he was deadly in the mid-range. And, James, we talked about it earlier in the show. He's to the point now where he understands how to get to whatever spot he wants to get to on the court and get his shot off. You know what I mean? Whether he's using a pick and roll or he's got a guy one-on-one. He said, Wh- whatever it is, if he wants a three, he can get that off. But if he wants to get to the mid-range, he finds a way to get to about 17 feet away. He rises and fires, and he's got that down pack right now. Yeah, it's crazy, too. I was looking at his his numbers, and from like 3 to 10 feet, he's shooting like 57%. From 10 feet to 16 feet, he's shooting like 64% on the mid-range jumper. Like and he's shooting ninety percent at the rim. I mean, these are numbers that are just like absolutely astounding. And you you talked about the Lakers game. There was a moment late where he just kept shifting gears and like changing speed and direction so fast that no one could stay with him. And he just floated around one guy after another after another. Finally got to the right side of the rim and finished all the way on the other side with his left hand. It was just like he is when he's rolling. He's like a video game and. It's fun to see, like, you know, talking to him in the locker room last night, talking to him a lot lately because they've been winning um, and he's been starring. You just see the confidence level and, like, he knows who he is. He really, really likes playing for Mike Brown, and that's that's been, like, a launching point for him. It's, you know, a coach that holds him accountable, that's on him the whole time. Fox, I mean, Brown was all over him during that game last night. I think it was in the third quarter. I uh, got all over him on a— Warriors fast break where um, Fox collapsed in the middle and left a guy wide open in the corner for a three. Um, But again, it's like, that's what he wants. He wants a coach that yells and screams at him uh, that holds him accountable just like everybody else. And that's what Mike Brown is. Yeah. And we had a conversation earlier. It it, it pertained far more to someone like Chemezi Metu than it did De'Aaron Fox, but we get so quick to, evaluate players particularly young players and sometimes we don't take into account um you know we may have known who Chumezi Metu was under Alvin Gentry and under Luke Walton but we didn't know what Chumezi Metu was under Mike Brown and it feels like that's a different player and I you know I use the example of Buddy Heald Buddy's obviously playing really well in Indiana there's probably a variety of different reasons for that but one of them is probably Rick Carlisle and watching what De'Aaron is doing this year, and I know we look at the talent around him and, and, and of course, you know, Sabonis and the hug heard around the world from last year. But when you factor in guys like Shemezi and Terrence Davis and the way that those guys are playing, man, I, I, I just lean further and further into, and this is the Mike Brown impact on this team. You know, like I've heard this said so many times that coaching at the NBA level really doesn't matter, that everyone basically runs – and I just – it's so far from the truth as a guy who's covered nine head coaches, uh, coaching matters. It does. And having a coach who, again, when it comes to Metu, like he's defined who and what Metu is allowed to be on the court and Metu's playing by the rules. That's it. Like if you're going to let Shemezi go out there and do whatever he wants, he's talented and, and he, he does some things that, like draws you to it and and you're hoping that um you know the three-point shot you watch him shoot it in practice and it goes in more than it misses but when he gets into a game it doesn't but now we're seeing like Shemezi Metu is is accepting a role and he's playing to his strengths and that's on Mike Brown because that's not who Shemezi Metu wanted to be coming into this season you could tell early in the the first couple of games and it's like look man if you're gonna play 
you're going to play my way or you're not going to play. I've got other options. I've got like 14 other guys who play center on this roster and you're just not going to play. So unless you want to buy in and do what I ask, then, you know, that's the rules. Those are the rules. And if you're not going to play by them, okay, I'll take the ball and you'll go home because he's the head coach who's under contract for four years. Mm -hmm. And so I I love it because, you know, it's these defining moments for young players that um, if they don't have this conversation, if they aren't told in a direct way and, and sort of the tough love mentality about who and what they are as NBA players, then they go along, uh, you know, thinking that they still have a chance to be a 35 minute a game starter who's going to make an all star team and all this stuff. If they will just accept their roles, and I think that's what Mike Brown is doing so far. He's getting guys to buy into their roles and just try to be a star in your role. I I, I love the way Metu has been playing uh, this year. You know, it, it's we talked about this where you know he was a guy where I wasn't sure if he understood the way he was supposed to play in this league, he wanted to get buckets because he's like, you mentioned, he's extremely talented. Like he can score the basketball, but to have staying power in this league, I didn't know if he understood exactly what he was going to need to do before time ran out to stay in this league and and be a a integral part of a team. And I had my doubts coming into the season, but this season, almost every single time he's played, I've loved what I've seen from Metsu and he's been Mm -hmm. valuable for what they've been trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Chimezi, I mean, he's still a guy who gets lost in a moment, right? Um, and part of that's experience. Part of it's just, you know, the type of player he is. He he does get lost in the moment. And, um, and you know, in a Mike Brown system, that can lead to, like, getting burned on the backdoor cut and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, like, I, I was just reading the chatty house and, you know, people, oh, Chimezi Metu's defense is horrible, right? Um, on the season, according to NBA.com, his offensive rating is a 117.3, which is about three percentage points higher than the Kings as a whole. And his defensive rating is 106.4. Chemezi Metu is a net rating of a plus 10.9. And so while someone can say that his defense, there are plays where he gets beat defensively, but that's just not the case overall. When he's on the court, the Kings are a better defensive team this team this season. And I don't know why that is, except for I can tell you that Mike Brown is coaching and Mike Brown's staff is coaching and they're working with players like this. And so, yeah, I, I would like to tell you that like that number is going to hold up all season and Shemezi Metu is going to be a guy who, who puts up a plus 11 net rating. Um, but if he does, the Kings are going to be a pretty good team. And that's, you know, that's kind of the way it is. If you can get your role players to all be plus, uh, like huge pluses in net rating, then you're going to win. Who's the next guy you think can take a, is, is there another step for this team to take defensively? Um, yeah, yeah. I I mean, we keep talking about like, okay. So on the offensive end, it's it's kind of, it's easy to be good on the offensive end because everyone who comes into the league was an offensive player. You know, mm-hmm. rarely do you have a guy who averaged like seven points a game on his high school team who makes an NBA roster. That's just not the way it works. It, every single one of these guys, you know, were all league, were all conference, were most of them were all state. Half of them were Mr. Basketball in whatever state they're from. Like, and the way you get there. At, especially at the high school level, is not by being a lockdown defender. It's it's very specific it's because you put up a bunch of points. So mm-hmm. getting that buy-in is isn't that hard. Um, getting the buy-in on the other end is what's really difficult. And I don't even think it's that the Kings aren't buying in. It's that like finding a flow and learning each other. You know, we always think about it again as the offensive end of the court where you want to know exactly what Kevin Herter wants the ball all the way around, you know, like those types of things. But on the defensive end, it's very similar. You have to have chemistry with your teammates. And if you're not, Oh, well, not- no, 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 no. Yes. That's not out of it. That was unofficial. Out of it. That That's was right. Yeah. But you understand my point. Like if, if you guys aren't all pulling the same way, then yeah. You know what happens? And and I'll tell you how I know that the Kings, while their defensive rating has gone down, 
I'll tell you that they're a better team. And as one stat, uh, Sabonis is not fouling out of every game. Mm. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that his teammates have pulled their head out of their behinds and are keeping their players on the outside like they're supposed to. And so he's not getting attacked and picking up stupid fouls as a help defender or as a guy who has to defend two or three guys because his his teammates have been blown by. And that's the stat that I will circle and tell you he is sort of like he's the linchpin in this for sure. But if he's on the court and like he had picked up his first foul in the fourth quarter uh, or maybe his late third last mm-hmm. game, like that tells you that they're playing better defense because they're just not getting to him. That's the second line or the third line of defense. And he's, he's still standing. And if he's still standing, then he's going to go out and get you 26 and 22 and eight uh, on certain nights and just dominate the action. He's still standing. He's still strong. Indeed he is. Um, James, is that all it is to you when it comes to uh, DeMontis Sabonis? Because there was a lot of concern earlier in the season about his play, finish around the basket. Um, I always thought it was really just the foul stuff. And if he was able to be in the game, he'd be fine. That's kind of what it looks like right now. But do you see anything different from his game from when the season started to right now? Uh, You know, I think he's settling in just like everyone else is. You know, we all want to just think that, oh, Sabonis was here last year. Sabonis was on the team for 15 games before he got hurt. And and while he was on the team for those 15 games, Aaron Fox was on it for like 14. And then, you know, like Harrison Barnes was there and Davion was there. But who else? You know, maybe a little Terrence Davis. Like none of these guys, like they all need more time together. And that's, you know, we always make the analogy that about, uh, you know, the, the pot of Deli, chili. The but, onions. Yeah. 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 But I mean, again, like I'll just get- getting. Yeah, there you are. getting comfortable. And the other thing I'll say about, like, you, you mentioned him missing shots around the basket and stuff. A lot of the reason why he he gets in those situations is because he's in foul trouble and he's trying not to be as aggressive while he's going to the basket. Uh, and it, so he's not picking up offensive fouls as well. And so I, I just think, like, he was off just by a smidge, though, not by a ton. And now all of his shooting percentages and everything else are right where they're supposed to be. Um, let's give away some tickets right yeah, now. The Kings one. and Detroit coming up um, Sunday, this Sunday, the 20th. Uh, caller number 3-916-909-1320. You can be in the arena. Afternoon game. What, at 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock. Yeah, right and, up my alley. And breakfast. Lunch. Exactly. That's this Sunday, right? Yeah. Niners don't play this Sunday. They play Monday mm-hmm. in Mexico. Mexico City. Yeah, Mexico oh. City. Uh, you can be in attendance to cheer on. We we got to get securing the Bagley the tickets. Like, he's still <laughs> riding the securing the Bagley. Like, give he even me, like, got him as the Abbey still. He's still, like, like <laughs> you got to let us know if you've got tickets to this game. We've, we've, we've got to get you there to see your guy. Uh, Marvin Bagley. So we got your tickets right now. Call the number three again, 916-909-1320, and we'll send you to see the Kings versus Detroit uh, coming up on Sunday. Uh, more we want to talk about with our 1320 Kings insider, uh, James Hamm. I know you got the opportunity to talk to De'Aaron a little bit, want to touch on some of that. Oh, you know what I really want to ask you about is the silent pr- the, the, the silent practice. Mm-hmm. Like not, The whole practice wasn't silent, but a portion of it was. And we we heard the the comments from Mike and Malik. So we want to we want to get uh, we, we want a little bit more perspective on what went on uh, on Saturday. So we'll come back. We'll talk more Kings basketball uh, with the creator of the Kings beat and our Kings insider James Ham here on Sacramento Sports Leader See them on KC on ESPN 1320. It's clear. Yeah. Thank you. You gotta okay. you gotta see this real quick. I don't know if you noticed it when it happened. But, uh, I saw you smiling. I, yeah, I did too. I was like, what is going on? I noticed it when it happened. And I was like, what the hell happened there? Or did you see this last? Was this the, is this the fan? So Malik out to the fan and then boom. <laughs> he took a bump to the floor. 
<laughs> I mean, was he trying to get a foul from the fan. Well, he looked at the fan. Well, he looked at him, and then he was like, "Yeah, my bad, dog." I did. No, I said I. I saw this. I remember seeing this. Yeah, yeah. It, it looked like Terrence got like double booted by a fan or something. He took a hell of a bump. <laughs> It, is that the monk one where he flew out of bounds? Malik, yeah, I said Terrence. Sorry, I mean. Oh yeah, yeah. Did he? I, did he trip over the ledge? I don't, is, oh, is that what he did? Did he trip? There's <laughs> a ledge back there. The ledge. Or he just flew back. Maybe he. Tr- maybe he tried to come back and he tripped over that ledge. That uh, too, but no, he, he went Titus O'Neil on him. Took a bump. Yeah, he he sure did. That. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Yeah, it was pretty dramatic. I I, I found it humorous. Uh, <laughs> oh, I've never seen that live. 516 to 27. Did you? <laughs> I, uh, oh. only one post game show last night. Shout out. Well, there's always only one post game show last night. <laughs> hey, it quick, quicker than I, quicker than I thought. Hey, um, so wait, there was only one last night? I think so. And that's 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 our people, right? Let's do some more, yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, you know, they got they they just got rid of Saturdays. Is that still going? Still? There are already? I think I think they only have like what, two episodes max. Wow. <laughs> Cold world, James. Cold, Cold world. world. <laughs> oh man, come OB. on. What? Come on, man. OBJ suing Nike. How dare he? You know, one of my favorite things is that Fox wants none of the the Malik Monk Band-Aid thing. Yeah, that's pretty (laughs) funny. I think it's absolutely hilarious. And I'm with Fox on this. Like, they keep calling it a cut. It's more like a small scratch on... Malik Monk's face, it's about like this big, and it's just like a little light skin mark, like right on his cheek. <laughs> I mean, hey, live the gimmick, baby. Live the gimmick. Yeah. Oh, it's funny. Yeah. Live the gimmick. I'm all for it. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, wait, James H. Did James Ham just try to win? <laughs> I, I wish. You know? Why would I need tickets to a game? Hey, when is um Goes a fan. Tyrese Halliburton? He he can sign his rookie extension this summer, right? Yeah, yeah. This will be his third summer, so going into his fourth season, he can sign a rookie skill extension. So they'll they'll be done having to say that. Well, oh, that put him on his rookie deal. I'll be done yeah. I just wonder though, like, like I mean, you're talking a. Of- Five year one sixty seven or whatever it is one seventy two now he and better, he better get the max yeah and don't that. stop people talking about it. he better he better not get one cent less than the max well y'all know. About him. well wait till they create the new Tyrese Max <laughs> hmm. Tyrese Max the Tyrese Max C <laughs> oh man hmm. Yeah, Tyrese is going to get the bag. I I agree with that. But again, that's something that isn't like thought into all of this stuff. Like that Sabonis was on the greatest contract for a a two-time All-Star that you're ever going to find. And that on top of that, um, Buddy Heald was on a Buddy Heald contract. So I'd argue Steph was on the greatest contract ever. But Oh, no, that's true. That's true. He was. She's very loud. <laughs> hey, like Stacey, people, I need you to quiet down. Is that people walking by? It's all it is. It's 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 it's, it's women with their shoes on that floor. That's like crazy. I could yell. I could yell her name, and she wouldn't hear me. But we can hear her walk by like there is a microphone on the floor. <laughs> is it? It's not a concrete. Fl- I mean, it's concrete underneath it, but there's carpet, isn't there? No, it's not carpet. It's uh, well, hardwood. 
out here. Yeah, but we usually hear them over here, right? Yeah, we hear them for sure over yeah. there. You can still hear them over here too. Huh. Yeah, a little, it's a little bit of both. Interesting. Got to get some area rugs. I remember right. through, uh, one of my old jobs, there was this guy. Hell is going on over there? <laughs> oh. Was that oh, that shit was food? on camera. What the hell was that? Was that astronaut food? That <laughs> Hey, I'm just going to, hey, David, that's not me typing. That's yeah. Brendan. Brendan yeah. sitting next to me. We're coming back, guys. I guess we'll say that I unfairly threw James Ham's typing under the bus the other day when playing one of his clips, and the, all, all we heard the whole clip was, the whole <laughs> clip, like, Hammer, what the hell, man? Like, what is going on? Turns out it was Brendan Nunez, who I could say this. I I I I got the 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 pleasure of sitting slash standing next to Brendan Nunez for most of yesterday's game. His note taking is phenomenal, mm -hmm. and is. he has a color coded note taking system that I had to ask him about, and it's spectacular. Like he has like a good color, a bad color, a potential question in the post game color. Mm. It's it's fantastic. He's just got pens everywhere. Terrific penmanship, like it. It is. It is. It is a sight to see. He was uh, looking like Bill Raftery the way. He was oh yeah. Out of oh yeah. He 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 was he was going to town. It's crazy the amount of notes he takes. Um, and, and it I'll also say this: like all of us, we do our job a totally different way. Like it seems like everyone's writing stories and stuff, and we should all be doing the same thing. Uh, but that's just not even like when I'm on TV, like. I would jot down a couple of bullet points and I would, if I had a quote from a player, I would write the quote down. Uh, but outside of that, I, I always spoke uh, like extemporaneously, like off the cuff um, with just basic ideas in my head. Um, I don't like to over prepare, but it's, it's really interesting to see how different people handle their job different ways. I don't take notes at all during the game. I mean, I write my, my takeaways like during the game, but my takeaways are from, what I'm seeing. So I guess you could look at those as notes, but they're also something that I just flow and like, just write them really quick. And I know exactly where I'm heading with almost every player. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting, especially with Brendan, cause it's like a gigantic, uh, spiral notebook and it's like, you know, an inch and a half thick spiral notebook. And he's just sitting there jotting notes the whole time. I can't so it's do funny. that. I, I also, I, I feel like this is important. Rory says, does he have one of those pens with multiple colors? Uh, nope. It's a bunch of different pens and they're laid out all over the table. Two, it's funny hearing you like describe that because you are Kenny and I'm Brendan. Yeah. Yeah. Like the you, way that you and Kenny fly off the, like you, you, you see something, you digest it and you react to it right away. I take notes and go back and look at it later. Like Brendan does. Yeah, when I'm prepping to run the podcast, and again, like I'm, it's I'm the host of the podcast. I, I have like topics that we're going to discuss, but that's it, like loose topics, and everything else is just like roll with it. Take go where the conversation goes. I usually take my notes on the Kings game. It's it's uh, hasn't been as easy this year. I've been doing a lot during these Kings games. I'm either at the game. Well, it's because you got to do 17 podcasts a night now yeah, with Jason. I got Jones. another one tonight, by the way. And we're recording it. <laughs> you guys, I can't believe you got suckered into that, dude. It's going it's down terrible. tonight. Drag <laughs> George Jesse into it, too. <laughs> He's back. We got another mouth to feed. It's bad. That's true. It's, it's true. Bad. Who am I to turn down a By the way, go to dloandkc.com and buy a t shirt because. <laughs> Kenny didn't wrap it up, so the family's getting bigger, and now we got to sell more T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny working 47 days a week now. <laughs> Reese damn near out of the house, and he's like, yeah, start over. Just hit the reset button. We was, we was more than halfway up out of this thing. <laughs> yeah. No, um, the light – I see the light decision. at the end of the tunnel. It was my decision. Yeah, I can reach out and see it, like touch the light at the end of the tunnel, and you're about to have a baby. Nope, <laughs> nope. <laughs> James, James's son is a smart ass though. He made me laugh last night as I was talking to James on the phone. And James, I don't remember what James. We asked him for something. Move. He, oh, synonyms. <laughs> 
<laughs> we needed a synonym. We used we moved we used moving in a tweet, but then we were gonna use move again, and we couldn't yeah. use move twice. And I'm like, man, I need. I'm driving. And I'm like, we need synonyms for the word move or moving. Yeah. And then he started popping off. <laughs> oh, it, 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 it made me laugh because we had already moved on. And we had, okay, we got this. We're good. And I just hear him in the background just reading words. And oh, it, yeah, it, it was it, like a shrimp gumbo, shrimp creole. <laughs> it was, was he just kept going. He just kept going. And he was being a smart ass. That's what he does. Sorry. Oh, if no. I, yeah. It was fantastic. No, it was fantastic. Well, speaking of, any thoughts on De'Aaron joining Clutch? Um, yeah, you know what, um, after, after we got done with our media session last night, uh, I, I did not post video of it because I, it was a quiet conversation. Um, I pulled De'Aaron aside and said, Hey, um, you know, uh, you and Chris, are you leaving Chris? Uh, cause I, you know, again, like he's been with Chris Gaston since, um, uh, you know, he, he was his trainer, I think in his high school days. Uh, so him and Chris Gaston are very, very close. They have been forever. They have, you know, still are. Yeah, and they still are. And so um, I don't know if that means that Chris is still going to be his trainer sometimes during the off season and stuff like that. Um, but uh, Fox was very clear that he will not be his agent moving forward. Uh, and there's going to be opportunities for everyone here. Um, but I, I think that's what people need to look at. They they don't need to freak out about you know the fact that he just went to LeBron's company. Uh, well, well, to Rich Paul's company, but you know, the basically LeBron is the big name on that brand. Uh, there are players all over the league that are clutch players, and if I'm De'Aaron Fox and I'm walking into the season and I don't have a shoe deal, uh, like you need you need a a big time big time name to go get you your shoe deal. Yeah. Um, and that's not the case for everyone, but in this situation, it, it did end up being the case, and. So uh, I think this is a good thing for De'Aaron. Uh, Clutch takes care of their guys, and just like Chris did, um, but they're still gonna, you know, be close. And uh, you know, he's not going away. I, I think it is kind of what I gathered from De'Aaron. But at the same time, um, De'Aaron used the term "level up." Um, this is like a level up move, and that makes sense to me. It's so, very, yeah. I thought I thought Damian broke it down perfectly earlier when we were talking about this. Is you know, Chris has, you know, family first and, and he's building that from the ground up. And I believe just the way I see them move and the guys that he's getting family first is going to survive. It's going to be a good company. They're going to have a long client list in the future. Today, they're not there. The Aaron Fox is playing today, right? He's getting endorsement deals and he needs endorsement deals today. And right now for where he's trying to get, he probably does need a clutch, a CAA, to kind of get him those deals right now in his career where he's trying to get to. And yeah. needed CAA. They needed the co-sign. Mm -hmm. You know, Family First is going to need a co-sign. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, like, I've covered plenty of players who have switched agents. So, uh, like, DeMarcus Cousins had, I think, three different agents while he was in Sacramento. Like, his first year or two, he had an agent – um, who is like a solo guy that, you know, took care of a lot of business for him. Um, but then he went on to like, uh, like again, big name after big name. Like, so like guys do this, they, they switch agents, especially guys who start with, you know, close friends or, or family members and stuff like that. Eventually you get to a point where, you know, it's just, it's hard. You're, you're limited slightly by their Rolodex and, and all that stuff. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's a good move for De'Aaron. I don't think Kings fans should be concerned at all. I think uh, Lakers fans can kick rocks that De'Aaron Fox <laughs> isn't going to the Lakers because he signed with Clutch. Um, but this is a good thing for De'Aaron. And, you know, it's about long-term financial stability for him and his family. He's making a ton of money with the Kings. But, you know, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have multiple generational money coming out of this career for De'Aaron Fox. You know, why not? take care of your family and the family that comes after that for a long time. Kick rocks, Laker fans. Kick rocks. Okay. Lake what, show. What the hell? Hey, let's talk about the emergence of fourth quarter Fox. Uh, De'Aaron has just been brilliant late in games recently. And I know you brought up the way he played uh, yesterday, but 
man, James, I thought he was incredible in that in the, in that Laker game. And he's you know, you, t- you talked about being a leader earlier and his emergence as a leader. Man, he's he's just he's playing this. I, I don't I don't even think this is just Mike Brown. I don't even think this is playing with a different level of confidence. Like he believes maybe for the first time in his career that everything he's doing can work. Yeah, he even said it last night that, uh, you know, his his teammates have shown faith in him to allow him to to close out games. Um, and, and you know what? Like, look, you talk about the Lakers game. You talk about the game last night. Go back to the Orlando game where, like, he he was so incredible. Uh, that is is that the game where they went to overtime? Yep. Yes. Yeah, the buzzer beater. A- yep. And he scored 28 points in the second half in overtime session. Yep. I mean, like, what he's doing in, late in games is crazy. And some of that is because they're allowing him to not play, to not go as hard early in games. They're relying on guys like Davion to come off the bench, but also Malik to carry a lot of the load for Sabonis to carry a bunch. And then when he gets to the fourth, he still has something in the tank. So I think that's part of it. Uh, but overall, like I, this is, it, it's crazy. He is, uh, he was a nominee again for Western Conference Player of the Week and he did not win it. That's the third time in four weeks, the first four weeks of the season, he's been nominated for the Western Conference Player of the Week three times. Mm. So, I mean, Took like... Steph Curry dropping 40, like, three times to beat De'Aaron Fox out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, well, that, uh, it, it really is impressive what you're seeing from him. I mean, we haven't seen, like, the blow-up crazy game like what we saw out of Joel Embiid last night. Oh, uh, or or oh, uh, ridiculous. Garland, Terry too. Garland had 51. Yeah. I didn't yes. realize they, they had 51. He had 28 in the fourth, and they lost. <laughs> I guess oh, they yeah. were down a ton to Minnesota and he clawed them all the way back and they couldn't they couldn't close it out. Yeah, I, I mean I think again, we're watching a team that's allowing a player to uh to like be there in the end, to to have the juice left to go out there and score and be a big big part of it. And then like think about it this way too. There's been a couple of games where they didn't go back to him in the fourth. Even though he is the closer, he is the guy who's who's coming out there and just shutting teams down. Um, you know, they they've slow played him a couple of times in the fourth quarter, and his numbers could look even bigger. But I don't know what it, one of the stat muse or someone put out the stats. He's like clutch points. He's shooting sixty four percent from the field. Like that was well yeah, that was oh, yeah. Oh yeah, is that who it was? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, the, the, he, he's doing a phenomenal job. And we talk about what he's doing on the offense. That's lights out. I love how he, he – it's not always perfect, but he's stepping up to the challenge on the defensive end. You know, it was – I'm not here to say it was like this game-changing moment or anything like that, but it might have been the block on Steph Curry. kind of comes out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And the way Steph Curry had, you know, been playing the last couple times in the fourth quarter against the Kings and against everybody, it was like every shot he takes – and the fourth quarter is going in. And De'Aaron Fox with the extra effort to block that shot. I thought Mike Brown did a phenomenal job. And, and Jordy Fernandez, whoever's in charge of the defense, uh, this time around saying, Steph Curry, we're not going to lose to Steph Curry. Mm-hmm. All right, we're trapping. We're getting the ball out of his hands. And if Andrew Wiggins and Clay Thompson and Draymond Green bring them home, we just got to tip our hats. And that's why you're the defending champions. But they didn't allow that to happen. They trapped it, got the ball to Steph Curry's hands, and they were able to get the W. But a lot of that kind of started with Fox's block in the corner, I thought. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I I thought that was huge. Uh, I think Fox had three steals as well. Mm. Um, Keegan Murray had a bunch of steals. All of a sudden, this team is figuring out ways to get steals. Um, there's a bunch of things hiding within the numbers we could look at. And I think that overall, what you're just seeing is that Fox is, is stepping up in moments, especially where he has to defend. Um, it's something that he knows he's got to be better at. Uh, he's got to, you know, give better effort. They came into that game and very specifically said, like, look, Steph might beat us, but he's not going to beat us from three. So they tried to take away the three, which is, his, I think he had, what, 13 points in the first quarter, but hadn't really hit him with a, a couple of three balls. Um, and then they really just, you know, they they sh- they sent uh, the shock at him. They did the, what, the box and one. Like, they they pulled out all kinds of different stops and said, hey, let's let's see if we can slow this guy down. 
And I think that's going to prove to be the the way to beat the Warriors going forward for a lot of teams. Uh, and, you know, the Warriors haven't been great, but a lot of those other players, they haven't been that good either. You know, mm-hmm. we talk about the Clay and, uh, you know, and yeah. Andrew Wiggins and, and Draymond Green. They haven't been phenomenal. And Poole, he really hasn't been that good against the Kings either. Mm-hmm. I just like that we got to see the Warriors three times in the first 12 games, and you saw incredible improvement every single game the first game i thought was a total wash and i don't care what the final score was the second game was highly competitive and you get jobbed on the end with a bad call uh where at least it should have gone to overtime and then we get to this game and i thought the kings were the better better team almost the entire night and that's that's a pretty good improvement outside of what the first quarter they were the better team they won three out of the four quarters yeah as uh mark jones would say our guy mark jones would say Aaron Fox last night on some of those drives to the basket, he was faster than gossip. (laughs) (laughs) My, 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 what was JR's old line? Um, Quicker than a hiccup? Uh, No, he used to have another one that I liked. Uh, Oh, he's not quick. He's sudden. That was the that was the line I always liked. Uh, Dr. Dev, six six two twenty five out of Oklahoma. That's it. Was always always where they went to college. We saw Keegan Murray kind of return to form last night, and he spoke openly about what he's been going through uh, for the last few days for the first time. And in true, you know, Keegan Murray fashion, did it with poise, calm, cool, collected uh, when discussing that stuff, you know, post game with 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 Matt and Kyle. But, uh, you know, hopefully this is a catalyst for him to kind of, you know, finding that groove again and. Mike never really steered away from him, though he might, st- you know, he steered away from him a couple of times late in games. Uh, he, he kept starting him. They kept going to him. They kept giving him an, uh, him an opportunity to get involved. And last night, man, he got involved early and his, his impact was felt through the whole game. Yeah, we're starting to see his confidence come back. That's what it kind of looked like. Uh, you know, he, he made five threes last night. Mm-hmm. Um, he even got it going early in the game with that steal and breakaway dunk. Um, yeah, he's, he's such a composed young man. And, uh, I think it, it's interesting because he's composed, but we did see him crack a little bit in that post game interview. I thought he showed a little bit of emotion. Um, mm-hmm. I also think it's really interesting when, um, he's asked about the fans and he keeps saying that this feels like home to him. And, uh, it, it's tough because, uh, like guys always forget people always forget that these guys are human beings and that they're going through things. Even Matt Barnes, you know, bringing up that he lost his mom during the season uh, back in like 2008 or 2009. Um, like these guys go through it. And, you know, Keegan's a young guy. He's very close to his grandma. Uh, she's still, you know, like struggling and, you know, it's, it's tough and it's tough because, you know, he was supposed to be, his family was supposed to be with him. Um, you know, they were there at the Charlotte game. That's when that happened with his grandmother at the game while he was playing and he didn't know what happened during the game. Um, but then his family member, like either his mom or his dad were supposed to travel with him to like Orlando and Miami and then one other stop and they just can't, they can't cause they've got, you know, life hit them. And so, uh, these are tough times for guys and you got to fight through and, uh, you got to have your teammates put your arms around you and, and like help you get through it. Uh, especially, you know, for a young guy who's out on the road for the first time, who's out away from home like this for the first time. And it really seems like this group is, is it's early, but they're pretty close. Mm-hmm. Right. And that, that always is there. There are teams that are close that are no good. Right. <laughs> They're probably not good for each other. I've seen that. Listener, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> Just being close alone isn't always like the best thing in the world, but it seems like this group is close early, you know, early on. There's a lot of guys that came here in the off season that, you know, it's their first 12 games playing each other with each other, but they're kind of close. They believe in each other. They play for each other and it manifests itself on the court with the way they play. They, they can, you know, play great games or they can be down uh, 12 points or 15 points or whatever. And you know what it is, James? They don't blink. They haven't blinked not once this year, not being down 15 to the defending champions, not being 0-4 to start the season. They haven't blinked once. They've been ready to go every single time they've come out there. Yeah, I definitely feel like the the bond between this group is growing. Um, I, like, 
you, you never know. I mean, you have to get to the darkest of dark times. And I think at 0-4, we saw a couple of cracks and like, where is this thing going to go? Um, but overall, I think this is a good group of guys. That's that's what, like, they've assembled a good group. It was a good group last year as well. Like, a lot of players like each other. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to be able to get through tough times. And um, that's something that I think this one, not only do they get along and do they feel like they're building chemistry, um, but they're also building some resiliency. And that's something that this Kings team doesn't usually have. They're not usually resilient. They get... Uh, they lose four in a row, and that four in a row becomes seven, eight, nine. Like I, I know, two years ago they had two nine-game losing streaks. Last year they had a seven-game losing streak. The year before that, the nine-game losing streaks. They had I think like either one or two eight-game losing streaks. Like mm-hmm. this team has to figure out a way to to avoid those big pitfalls, or it, there's just no way to climb out of it. You know, like you six and six can go to six and thirteen really fast, and that's nearly impossible to climb out of. And so as long as they're keeping it close, they're relying on each other, um, and they're kind of building on that resiliency, I think they'll be okay. James Ham, Kings Beat. Subscribe to the Kings Beat newsletter over at thekingsbeat.com. Subscribe to the Kings Beat YouTube channel right here on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching the show before you go anywhere, man, become a subscriber. If you're not one, you'll like us, I promise. Hit the thumbs up uh, if you enjoyed Uh, Today's show, we're back tomorrow. We'll be gearing up for a nationally televised game. We will talk more about the 49ers as well. Um, Coach David Patrick's going to be with us on Wednesday. So, man, what a shout out to Chris Haynes. Yeah, man. Shout out to James Ham. Yes. Shout out to Terrence Davis. Uh, If you missed today, if you missed the first hour of today's show, you missed an (laughs) epic hour. Scroll back and take a listen, and we'll see you here tomorrow at noon on Sacramento Sports Leader ESPN 1320. Go Kings.